but you're right to, to draw a parallel with Russell Brand in that, you know, those are two completely different cases, two completely different people, but the, the massive audience defending them are the same and they're defending them on the same misguided grounds, um, which all revolve around a, like a misunderstanding of how reporting sexual assault works and and how it's criminally prosecuted. You mentioned maker Matt Shea has spent the last four years investigating the world's most notorious misogynist provocate provocateur, embedding himself in influencer Andrew Tate's inner circle. In a world currently buffeted by allegations of misogyny and sexism against Russell Brand and worse, allegations Brand vehemently denies, Shea's film couldn't seem more timely. Abuse of power, misogyny, their familiar totems and still it appears sadly not yet consigned to history. Despite receiving a barrage of online abuse from Tate's fans, Shea's new BBC documentary, Andrew Tate, The Man Who Groomed the World, uncovers the reality of what goes on in that shadowy world. Let's take a quick listen. You cannot do a business relationship with a female. It doesn't work. That's when the pimping starts. I remember him keeping all the money, not even me, giving me one dollar. I'd keep 80% of the money they made. So they basically worked for free. They worked for my love and attention. Well, Matt, I mean, depressingly familiar to some of the quotes that um, we've been extracting from Russell Brand's bookie work. Um, and a lot of the conversation uh, around Russell Brand has been about the fact that that's a culture that would no longer be tolerated today and he wouldn't be allowed to to broadcast, um, uh, uh, you know, the sort of things he, he was saying back in the, you know, early noughties. Um, but... Actually, Andrew Tate, uh, if I'm not wrong, sprang to global dominance as the leader of a sort of millions and millions of disgruntled and often adolescent young men, mostly during the pandemic, which is, of course, far more recent. Is that not true? That's true. And, and actually, yeah, the idea that you can no longer broadcast these viewpoints to a huge audience is kind of disproven by Andrew Tate. It's just that he's able to do it through social media and arguably achieve an even wider audience than through mainstream media. I mean, what's um, most of you, you've made two documentaries about uh, Andrew Tate now. And and I suppose the most revealing thing in this latest is that he's just, in a way, the front man for this entire network of people enlisting men to coerce and abuse women. And these are, you know, this is hate speech against women, a lot of, of, of what he's saying, really quite shocking stuff. And and I, I mean, I, I find the whole thing actually riveting and hard to understand how, how he you know, went from being this sort of guru, I mean, warped guru, if you will, to being basically involved in the sex industry. Yeah, that's right. So most people will know Andrew Tate for his online content. Um, a recent survey suggested that 52% of 16 and 17 year old males in the UK have a positive view of Andrew Tate. And, you know, his content is quite openly misogynist. So that's obviously worrying for parents and teachers. Um, but yeah, what we uncovered is that actually, there are a series of allegations centered around his society called the War Room, which is a kind of paid for all male networking group that you can join that's ostensibly run by Andrew Tate. And uh, we had exclusive access to me internal messages from this group and we uncovered around 45 potential cases of women who were uh, potentially trafficked by this group using a method that this group teaches into the webcam sex trade. So this isn't just kind of online misogynist content, but as you said, these are allegations of actual uh, trafficking. And and as you say, um, so the, 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 the course that you're talking about that teaches people uh, unbelievably how to be involved in the sex industry is it, called PhD. You could maybe tell me what that stands for. And it's one of quite a number of courses offered uh, from a sort of starter price of around $16, $17 to, to the much more expensive full-on membership of, of, of the War Room. Let's talk first, though, about PhD and what that is. So, yeah, so it stands for Pimping Hose Degree, and it essentially is a kind of manual for how to gradually manipulate a woman over a long period of time into working for you in uh, the sex industry and giving you all the money. You approach the woman as, as though you're romantically interested in her. She thinks that she's getting into a normal relationship. Over time, that relationship becomes weirder, more controlling, 
and uh, then eventually she's coerced. And just to give you an idea, I can read a mess one of these internal messages um, from someone very high up in the war in the war room talking about this course to members who've signed up for it. And he says, it becomes a series of gradual steps to remove her entire support structure from her life. Then we punish her for a transgression, real or imagined, by having her get our name tattooed on her, leaving her family's home, apartment, town or country, and then webcamming, stripping, or walking the track for us, which means prostitution, um, escalate, escalate, escalate. So this is the kind of um, sort of almost brainwashing system or they see it as brainwashing that they're actually trying to perform on women and teaching men to do the same and i mean you know i i hate to keep bringing it back to russell brown but i think it's really important that we sort of contextualize at what these men seem to have been able to get away with and and what it looks like is we have these monstrous misogynists at at, at absolute best who've been hiding in in plain sight i mean everything that you're uh, uh, discussing with me there suggests that it's no mystery, it's no surprise uh, to find the sort of allegations against Andrew Tate that now exist, you know, allegations of, of rape, of running this sex business. I mean, he, he's almost admitting to most of it in, in his quotes. Yeah, I mean, technically, he does deny these allegations. But yeah, he brags about this sort of behavior constantly. In fact, it's something that's led to him getting a following. And I think, you know, you're right to, to draw a parallel with Russell Brand in that, you know, those are two completely different cases, two completely different people, but the the massive audience defending them are the same, and they're defending them on the same misguided grounds, um, which all revolve around a, like a misunderstanding of how reporting sexual assault works and, and how it's criminally prosecuted. Um, you know, for example, there's this, there's this myth that there are just loads and loads of men in prison under kind of false sexual assault allegations. But the number, you know, loads of legal um, studies have shown is infinitesimally small, especially when you compare it to the thousands, tens of thousands of women who are sexually assaulted, who never see their uh, alleged perpetrators have any form of justice whatsoever. Um, you know, or there's this idea of, oh, well, if it was a, um, a sexual assault, why are they only reporting it several years later? But that's often not the case. Often they will tell someone or they'll go to a rape crisis center immediately when it happens. I mean, why would someone make that up, you know? So it, 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 there are so many um, myths around, around rape and sexual assault. I mean, allow people myths is a nice way to put it. I mean, it seems to me that they're total untruths that are being peddled. I mean, talk about yeah. fake news. And, and some of the quotes are just, you know, horrendous. I, I, he says, I keep 80% of the money the women make. Uh, so they're basically working for free. They're working for my love and attention. Uh, you cannot do a business relationship with a woman. It doesn't work. That's how the pimping works. Uh, and, and those are the sort of ones that I can I can read out on radio. What was it that, that first interested you in investigating the phenomenon that, that, that he's become? Well, for me, it was just this moment of, you know, I, I think, like a lot of people, thought that we were living through a progressive era with the Me Too movement and, you know, all these other progressive movements um, around women's rights, that, that, that society was kind of moving in the right direction on this. And then our friend's nephew um, showed us a video of this guy, Andrew Tate, that he was watching, and all of his friends were watching him. They're all repeating everything he said. And it seemed to me that we're actually regressing. We're going backward on this issue. If we're not careful, you know, we are going to be raising a generation who have very different views on uh, on on these topics than we do. Mm. And 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 I mean, how uh, do you explain? Uh, you mentioned a percentage there, and I didn't quite catch it. But how do you explain his appeal to adolescent boys, brought up as you say in what we think is a a sort of brave new world where where sexism and misogyny are, are words that can, we can kind of file in the box called past. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I would explain it quite simply with social media, and in particular TikTok. I mean. Tick, the relentlessness of the TikTok algorithm is unprecedented compared to other social media. You could be an adolescent boy and within hours of creating a TikTok account, stumble upon videos where Andrew Tate is saying things along the lines of, you know, women who uh, choose not to have children are miserable, stupid, you know, swear words that I can't say. Um, or, you know, virgins are the only women worth worth dating. You know, just, just other misogynistic things. You, you come across that instantly. Um, and that is totally new, and it's a problem that people who are a bit older, people like us, we don't, we're always 
few steps behind because we don't really know what our kids are watching. So this really came out of nowhere. And do you think that the the, the sort of proliferation of pornography as well has, has sort of inured kids of that generation to the sort of to the to the ways in which Andrew Tate speaks about women because an awful lot of pornography is represented representative of those kinds of thoughts I'm not there's a lot of debate over the role of pornography in this I think it must play some role because it is one of the uh, the, the biggest changes you know when you look at society today versus several years you know decades ago mm. Um, but I think it, it's other things too. The, the reason, the appeal of Andrew Tate to young men isn't just the um, how he treats women. It's also he surrounds himself with expensive cars, um, it, that flashy lifestyle. Mm. Uh, you know, people want to earn money, and they think that Andrew Tate will be the the key to them becoming wealthy. And of course, Andrew Tate markets himself as a guru who can help you become wealthy. Of course, you have to purchase his courses, which are very expensive and arguably he ends up exploiting you for his own wealth. But but that, the currency that he works with is also wealth and prestige. What's his reaction been to you delving deeper and deeper over the course of these two films into the mythology swirling around him and the sort of toxic mythology? He, he sort of has spearheaded this kind of social media campaign against me where he calls me the DNG, which stands for Dork Nerd Geek. And that gives you an idea of kind of the maturity level of this group of, of men who are actually in their 30s, but kind of speak like they're 14. But they, they, they have this social media campaign where they try and everything I say, they try and discredit it. They'll say that the women I interviewed, um, you know, were paid actors or um or you know things like that and you know those will, those claims to discredit my reporting are posted by accounts on social media who are then amplified by bots who are all connected to the societies that the tates run so it, it's very difficult um you know mainstream media is one thing you know i can we can do this radio show and probably everyone listening thinks it sounds reasonable but if you go on social media on x you know you you would it would seem as though people didn't believe anything that we reported on because that's what these uh, organized discrediting campaigns give the impression of. Mm. Uh, you, you mentioned there this group of men and, and that's very much what this latest film zooms in on, which is the war room. And uh, although it's fronted by Tate, it's largely orchestrated, it seems, by this man called Iggy Semmelweis. Can you tell me a little bit about him and, and what you believe the war room actually to be? Yes, yeah, so on the outside, the warm sells itself as a kind of networking society for men who want to become rich and successful, and it's ostensibly led by Andrew Tate. But if you delve into it, at least a part of the warm is actually the society that, as we discussed, trains men how to groom women into online sex work. And as you said, what we found is that the person who seems to be running it is this guy, this self-proclaimed wizard guy. This the story just gets stranger and stranger the more you go into it, named Iggy Semmelweis. It's, that's not even his real name. His real name is Miles Sonkin. And he's kind of like a pickup artist, self-proclaimed hypnotist and wizard um, who has helped to craft Andrew Tate through social media campaigns, through creating this kind of cult of personality into this almost mythological, hyper-masculine hero figure. Uh, and then used him and his image to market membership to the war room which costs around six thousand pounds a year to join um so it, it is and and this in the documentary we kind of find iggy Semmelweis in in uh, los angeles and confront him about this stuff and what ultimately can be done to combat uh, what we've established to be you know mythology at the very best uh, that's that's put out there by this group and the fact that it still remains alluring to kids who you really would have thought would have grown up to to you know be able to better handle the world I think it's a really good question and I think there's a lot of answers there need to be a lot more um kind of positive um, models of masculinity that that are out there. Um, but also, I think it, it goes back to what we were discussing earlier. Until social media has the same system of checks and balances that their arguably competitors, mainstream media have, we, you can't just say a falsehood. Everything has to be fact checked. Um, 
it, until social media has that, then there will always be oxygen added to these dangerous ideas, these irrational ideas, these illogical, non-evidence-based ideas, um, which you know they only really gain momentum on platforms where you can say whatever you want without it being um, checked at mm. all. And just finally, I mean, do you think that uh, Andrew Tate has further ambitions or do you think he'll end up languishing in jail? I absolutely think that he has further ambitions. I don't think this story is going to end. Even the, um, you know, our documentary all gets collapsed into his narrative that he's some kind of martyr and messiah. Uh, if he goes to jail, he'll probably continue arguing that, you know, he's a martyr. Mm. Uh, you and know, there are, probably... as you point out, there are many, many millions of people who believe that. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm, extraordinary. Uh, that was really good of you to join me and, and uh, you know, bring us into that 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 world that I still find very, very puzzling indeed. You may have to come back and talk to me about it a bit more. Uh, but that was documentary maker Mark Shea talking to me about his film, Andrew Tate, The Man Who Groomed the World.